Welcome to A Look Ahead. If you've seen us before, you know that we're doing the Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School lessons, and this is the first lesson for a new quarter, the, four, the last four, uh, I'm sorry, three months of 2012. And this series of lessons will be a study of the fundamental beliefs, or some of the fundam fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The very first fundamental belief that we're talking about is the Great Controversy. <clears throat> and we will call it the Foundation because that's what the lesson calls it, the Foundation. And uh, before we begin our study of this fundamental belief, let's have a word of prayer if you'll bow your heads with us. Our kind and loving Father, as we turn now to this very foundational, fundamental belief of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, may we correctly represent you May we say what you want us to, and may the Holy Spirit carry our words through the space to whoever our listeners are, and may this message touch their hearts as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> so um, this lesson will focus on the great controversy that, that has involved the entire universe since Satan rebelled in heaven and convinced our first parents to join his side. I'm sure you're all familiar with that story as it's found in Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to read just a couple of the ver of verses from chapter 12 of Revelation, starting with verse 7. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels, but the dragon was defeated and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. So the two sides are pretty clearly identified right there in the beginning. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with a book that came out some years ago entitled Seventh-day Adventists Believe, our, our fundamental belief number eight reads as follows. I have I've put it here in the handout. All humanity is now involved in a great controversy between Christ and Satan regarding the character of God, his law, and his sovereignty over the universe. By the way, if you would like to have this to watch or to look on, on as, as we're studying together, these handouts are always available in advance on our website at Theological Crossroads, which we've abbreviated as Theox, T-H-E-O-X, dot O-R-G. T H E O X dot O R G, and you can get the same handouts that we're looking at. Reading on, this conflict originated in heaven when a created being, endowed with freedom of choice and self exaltation, became Satan, God's adversary, and led into a rebellion a portion of the angels. He introduced the spirit of rebellion into this world when he led Adam and Eve into sin. This human sin resulted in the distortion of the image of God and humanity, the disordering of the created world, and its eventual devastation at the time of the worldwide flood. Observed by the whole creation, this world became the arena of the universal conflict. Paul calls it a theater or a stage, out of which the God of love will ultimately be vindicated. To assist his people in this con controversy, Christ sends the Holy Spirit and the loyal angels to guide, protect, and sustain them in the way of salvation. Now that's the official fundamental belief number eight for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But I would like to now set a kind of stage for us to look at some, some materials a little bit later in our lesson, so bear with me for a moment. Taking the Bible as a whole, we discover in Revelation 12, 1 to 17, that the war, the conflict, began in heaven itself, in the most holy place, right beside God's throne. I mean, this was God's foremost messenger, the first of the created beings. Lucifer, who was one of the covering cherubs, began to feel jealous because he was not treated the same as Jesus Christ, even though the two stood, seeming to, seemingly to him as equals, on the two sides of God's throne. Before long, Lucifer suggested to other angels that he could run a better universe than God did. 
In his universe, every angel would be allowed to govern himself to do what he thought was best. In God's universe, each individual is expected to act in a loving, kind way, reaching out to all around them and to serving each other. After Satan was defeated and cast down to this earth, he demanded the right to have access to our first parents, Adam and Eve. God tried to protect them by eliminating Satan to one tree in the garden, although he did place that tree in the center of the garden near the tree of life, and you know the story there in Genesis 2. He severely warned our first parents, but in her curiosity, Eve wandered too close and found herself engaged in a conversation and was tempted to eat of the fruit, which she soon handed to her husband, who ate it as well. And thus we have the story of Genesis 3. And when, when, when Satan uh, took this position, and the angels took their position, the evil angels, we call them evil today, mm -hmm. this was sin, and we understand sin to be things, choices one makes which separates one from God, which is the life source. Basically, it's, it's mm -hmm. my understanding. Didn't S Satan know? How could how could these yeah. angels not not know, understand this about? Uh, I mean, we have a perception that the angels and all the created beings. My perception is these people are a whole lot smarter than we are, or mm -hmm. beings or whatever. They're super intelligent, and they live in the presence, right in the presence of God. How how how? How could you not understand that if I separate myself from, from God and his principles, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to die, I guess. Yeah. How, how could that? Well, I, there's only a couple of possible explanations that I know of. One, it would be that Satan was an incredibly successful and careful and, 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 and deceptive person. Well, I know, but he... He should have been, he should have known this himself. Exactly. This is no what we argument. call the mystery of iniquity? Yeah. Or? I don't think that they had the knowledge to know that <clears throat> if they followed a different course, it would lead to separation. There, what, what, what in history would have told them that? But don't you think God, before, before the war actually began in heaven, that God called them together. Ellen White suggests this. Yes. That he called them together and said, look, I want to make it very clear to you what's going to happen. Yeah, he's just making a sales pitch. Yeah, well, why would... The question Jay is asking is, why would a whole lot of very intelligent angels choose to believe Lucifer instead of God the Father? And, and the big question, why is it that, I mean... Why is it that Satan would not understand yeah. that the actions he was taking would separate him, yeah. and and th that just just that separation would would be his death? I guess if I could answer that question, I'd have an excuse for sin. Maybe. <laughs> well, fortunately, long before this earth was created, God had made a plan to cover this contingency. But look back at what happened between the serpent and Eve at the tree of good of, of good and evil. God had said that sin leads to death. And there's our Genesis 2, 15 to 17 passage. As soon as he had opportunity, Satan responded by saying, that is a lie. Genesis 3, 1 to 5. Although we do not know what Satan Lucifer had said to the angels in heaven, and Jay, that's sort of your question there, those words from his conversation with Eve give us a hint. The basic issue in the great controversy is this. Who is telling us the truth. And basically, to put it in another way, can God be trusted? And most people answer that question, well, of course he can be trusted. Of course he can be trusted. But? But they don't act like he yes. can be trusted. Rightly or wrongly, in our day, when we talk about these issues, we strongly bias the response by calling one side God's side and the other side Satan's side. And of course, every time you think about it, you choose Satan's side, right? Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, you know, immediately we biased people's response. Was that clear to the angels who first rebelled in heaven? And Norm, that was your sort of question. Did they really think that by joining Satan's side, they were calling God a liar? And what about us today? Is there any question in our minds about who, that is God or Satan, is telling us the truth? 
When we are tempted to sin, do we clearly identify the two voices speaking in our heads as God and Satan? If the time ever came when we were not sure whether a given voice in our head was God or Satan speaking, how do we determine who it was? How, um, it, 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 this portrays it as, as um, this being subject to the sin stuff is, as it's just a matter of choices, but I don't know, somehow it, it seems as though that, that since this first act of sin, I guess on the part of Eve, it's like there's some magic switch <laughs> that's been turned on that, you know, that, that we just can't, oh, well, I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I can go right into heaven right now. It's an infection. What, what, yeah, what? Sin is a disease, and the diseases need to be healed. The remedy is, a, right? Mm -hmm. and, you, and you have to cooperate with the healer. Ken, you said, you said that Satan said it was a lie. Mm -hmm. He didn't really say that, yeah. though, did he? Oh, yeah, that's absolutely. He said it was a lie? <laughs> yes. No, that's I, thought he, he just, that's not I thought he just contradicted it. Well, he said that's not true. <laughs> well, well, why I'm, why I'm saying this is that it, to me, when I read. first read it, it it came across like maybe Eve thought that he heard God wrong. Genesis you three know? four. It wasn't really a look at look at right here right here Genesis three four right on the screen. The snake replied, "That's not true. You will not die." Yeah, but she's he's saying that what she said is not true. Well, she was quoting God. Well, see, I, I wonder if she kind of thought that maybe he dis he did she didn't understand him, right? Whatever. That he's correcting her. <laughs> well, the RSV is probably as literal as you can get uh, that we have available, and it says, "You will not die." Well, yeah, but but the, still making said, my point is that maybe Eve didn't think that that God was lying; that she heard it wrong from him. See, well, that's a possibility right there, and and uh, they probably but had more than one discussion. We're kind of making this as, as black and white, and like you said, you know, did everybody know that there was a lie and that we're going to be on God's side versus the devil's well, side? So, but the question is, if that's true, then you're you're saying God didn't make it clear to them in Genesis two what He had in mind. No, I'm saying that the devil made it unclear to him. Okay. To well, that's well, I, I'm not sort of saying the, right sort of exactly that that the devil came up and mm -hmm. confronted God and said, "No, he's not telling the truth. He's a liar. He isn't mm -hmm. saying that at all." He says, "Note that statement is wrong." Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could so, be. It well, could so, be okay, a, so he said it with pleasant words. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not saying yeah, pleasant words. I'm, I'm trying to read her. <laughs> what if he said it with a pleasant reading? voice? It also, <laughs> it, just, it just seems to me like it's too, <laughs> too black and white and she no, he was just stupid. He sugarcoated it and he says you're going to become like God knowing good and evil. Mm -hmm. And that was something to be... That was true though. That's true, exactly. That was absolutely true. Absolutely, because God later in, the, in, in chapter 3 says, Behold, man has become like one of us knowing good and evil. But now, that was a sugar coating over the cyanide capsule. I wonder if it isn't easier for us to understand because we know the story. Yeah. And we live, we live the experience. Well, well, I'm not saying that one is true or not the other. I mean, I'm just saying that there, there's a possibility to look at it in more uh, yeah. ways than just one. I view it, I think the devil, as far as he went, that was deceiving. What he should have said was, you won't die now, but in the end you will. And he yeah. didn't. He just sugar-coated it and left it hanging, and she bought it without thinking. Yeah. Well, no doubt Satan thought he had nearly won the great controversy, at least here on this earth, when God suddenly sent the flood. By rescuing Noah and his family, God preserved the one small group of people that were still listening to him. About one more generation of evil, and not a single person would have been left here on this earth who was listening to God at all. That, that last statement bothers me. Well, I mean, it's almost as if it proved Satan was right. Well, it might have seemed like, I'm sure Satan thought so. I'm sure, ab I mean, if you started out with a perfect family and a few generations later, you have 
what led up to the flood, what would you think if you were on Satan's side? Well, I know, but this last one says one more generation, and you know there wouldn't have been anything. So very likely, it, it, it seems like it almost proves that Satan is right, and he's so God. So God intervened. Well, yeah, but God steps in before before well, Satan it, it, is proven to be right. Well, and God steps in several times <laughs> when it looked like Satan is just about one. It's fairly easy if you accept the fact that the Bible is giving us a historical account to trace the work of Satan and God down to the generations. And our, our Bible study guide for this week does that and does a good job. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Ellen White has done a marvelous job to expand that understanding in her Conflict of the Ages series. Of course, that's five pretty good sized books. What we learn in reviewing all of this is that Satan has done everything possible to picture God as the one who is arbitrary, vengeful, exacting, unforgiving, severe, a tyrant, and he goes on and on and on. Attributes which are the very characteristics that describe Satan's nature and his kingdom. So why would anyone believe that? And what has been God's response to these attacks? They would question it because they had no evidence that he was wrong. That's a problem. You know, why do we still believe it today? That's yeah. the big question. Yeah. yeah. Well, the With all of the evidence that yeah. we have. Yeah. The usual Christian response is that God has dealt with Satan's accusations by repeatedly defeating the devil in various conflicts. Some people would say, well, God snatched victory out of defeat at the flood. God snatched victory out of defeat when he took the children of Israel out of Egypt. If he just left them a little while longer, they would have melted into Egypt. There would be, there would be no, none of God's followers left. But we know that God and the devil do not fight with guns or even nuclear weapons. And here's, here's where we're talking to talk about the real issues. So, so bear with me. Point out where I'm wrong if I'm wrong, okay? <coughs> God and the devil do not fight with guns or even nuclear weapons. What are the weapons in that war? Persuasion. God can only use truth and evidence. Satan uses lies, deception, accusations, implications, and every other deceitful device of which he can think. He twists the truth. He does whatever he can. So how are we supposed to know which side is speaking on any given occasion? Whether God, whether God is throwing us a straight ball or Satan is throwing us a curve ball. So when it speaks of a war in heaven, was it just an argument? Or was there actual physical contact between? Well, and, Jesus, and, Jesus and there are passages said, that we have available that uh, Ellen White, I'm thinking of something Ellen White says. She had mentioned that something about angels excel in strength and so on and so forth. So, but you've got angels on both sides. So, well, yeah, but these are the good angels that excel in the <laughs> but, but Jesus so, said that he was a murderer from the beginning, mm -hmm. right? Liar. Well, if he was a murderer, he wasn't really murdering yet. I mean, nobody was dying yet, but he was, he was a he, murderer from the beginning. He managed to get Cain to kill Abel, and he was right behind that. Right. I, he might have been a murderer even before that. Well, but he we didn't just kill don't anybody know. yet. I don't have a record of it. Well, so, if murder is, is defined by killing somebody right then, mm -hmm. yeah. that's... So it's not well, a war with force, with uh, weapons. Mm -hmm. It's a war of thoughts and ideas and mm -hmm. words. So this, this was the war, I mean, I always figured these angels had... Throwing mountain kinda, chains at each other like Milton said. Well, I don't know about weapons, but at least... Hand-to-hand -hand combat? Yeah pushed him out of the way or something, you know, I don't know. But, I, uh, I don't think that Satan was all that happy having to leave heaven. No. So what the, what the celestial war implements are, I don't know, but they got used on him because he got thrown out. Deception and substitution. Don't so, I mean, I, we have no well, information as to what, what, what kind know, of conflict. That's right. What we know is what he's been doing since then. That's right. And this is what we're talking about. And if angels, some angels are described as in chains, yeah. you know, so they're not real chains, but they're yeah. doing the same thing. 
Yeah. So there's there well, is something happening. It is obvious that uh, is it always obvious who is telling the who is speaking? Uh, uh, sorry, is it always obvious who is telling the truth and who is lying and deceiving? Remember that the day is coming when Satan himself will arrive here on planet Earth, claiming that he is the Son of God. And he will use the same kinds of methods that Jesus used to prove his messiahship when he was here on this earth. Miracles, the words of scripture, and the influence of what might seem to some like a Holy Spirit. Hmm. But there are certain things that must always be remembered. The truth must always be consistent with itself. Truth, if it's real truth, has to be consistent with every other truth that is real truth not have truths, and so forth. Eve wandered over there and got into Satan's territory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he put the hex on her. Mm -hmm. I, have, uh, I, I'm, I believe that when he comes as an angel of light to some places, if we should wander over there, mm -hmm. he'll probably put the hex on us too. I don't think that's a place you could go and experiment. And he's had at least 6,000 years of practice. Right. Mm. But remember this, Satan's basic weapon is selfishness. God's basic weapon is love. But what about that question asked at the tree back in the Garden of Eden? Does sin lead to death or doesn't it? Now all of us and I, I, I like all you people, I'm very happy we're studying this together, but I, I'm 100% sure that the whole bunch of you are sinners. Of course, not, excuse me, no, including me, we're all sinners. Do we do that because we really want to die? Well, no. We, we, we're so used to being surrounded by sin that we sort of think it's normal. If we look around us, recognize that every one of us is a sinner, we would have to admit that there are not many people who are obviously dying of sin right at this point. I mean, when you're a pathologist, have you ever put down on a, birth, uh, on a death certificate, <laughs> died of sin? Never did. Never did, okay. Should have put the truth down, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, write that in somewhere. I hope that See wasn't deceptive happens. in most reports. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> 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 I never well, did get to the right place. <laughs> yeah. You better be get, go back and start over. Start over again. Progressive revelation and perception. <laughs> well, so maybe Satan was right. But when the right time came, the Bible says, Galatians 4.4, 4, God sent his son to this earth to answer most of Satan's accusations and questions in one lifetime. When Jesus died on the cross, it was not death from crucifixion. He died within six hours. Death from crucifixion takes a long time. Did Jesus really die? When they stuck a spear into his side, they discovered that he was already dead. When, um, Satan had also claimed that when people do die, they die because God is angry at them for disobeying him. Well, did God kill Jesus? Jesus certainly did not cry out, my God, my God, why are you killing me? No, he said, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? Matthew 27, 46. And probably the scariest part of that whole story is this. The people who were so determined to have Christ dead were doing it in God's name. Were they confused about whose side they were on in the great controversy? If you had asked them, if you had been there on that Friday as they were escorting Jesus <coughs> carrying the cross out to, the, to, to Calvary, and you said, whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? What God's would they have said? God. Absolutely, there was no question in their mind. Now, how did that happen? The devil was a very good deceiver. The devil is a very good deceiver. They were tithe-paying, health-reforming, Sabbath-keeping, Seventh-day Adventists. Yes. Adventists killed Jesus. Or at least they saw to it that he got killed. You know, we well, now, make your Adventists with a small A and not a big A. They were looking for the Messiah to come the first time. Well, they, yes, uh, right. And, and today, a lot of Adventists 
not necessarily Seventh day Adventists, a lot of Adventists, people looking for the Lord re to return, would still nail Jesus to the cross if they had the opportunity. Well, unfortunately, if you look back at history and, you, and you, you're honest, we Seventh day Adventists tend to be most like those Pharisees. Oh. Well, you could have talked a long time and not said that. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you getting that idea? Now you've gone to meddling. <laughs> yeah. Well, Revelation 12, 17, coming to the end of that chapter we started with, tells us very clearly that Satan, with his immense intelligence and all of his demonic assistance, while realizing that their fate was sealed by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, also know, the whole lot of them know, that by misleading and deceiving human beings, they have been able to delay the second coming of Jesus Christ almost 2,000 years. They're doing a pretty good job, aren't they? What will it take to bring that deception to an end? Do we need to understand very clearly what the issues are in the great controversy? Absolutely. Consider these following quotations from the Bible and from Ellen White. We are the we are theater of the universe. That's um, uh, 1 Corinthians 4 and 9. There's a story in Job, and we don't have time. But, well, let's look at a couple of these. You, you, these ones are probably very familiar to every Adventist. When the day came for the heavenly beings, this is Job 1, 6. When the day, day came for the heavenly beings to appear before the Lord, Satan was there among them. He was claiming to be the head of this earth, to represent this earth in the heavenly council. The Lord asked him, what have you been doing? Satan answered, I have been walking here and there, roaming around the earth. Did you notice my servant Job? The Lord asked, there is no one on earth who is faithful and good as he is. He works with me and is careful not to do anything evil. Satan replied, would Job worship you if he got nothing out of it? And you know the rest of the story. And it goes on. Daniel 9, 21 is a very interesting. While I was praying. These are examples of how the conflict appears in the pages of Scripture. This is Daniel speaking. While I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came flying down to where I was. It was a time for the evening sacrifice to be offered. He explained, Daniel, I have come here to help you understand the prophecy. When you began to plead with God, he answered you. He loves you, and so I have come to tell you the answer. Now pay attention while I explain the vision, and so forth. I mean, we see that heaven and earth are very close in Scripture. There are angels involved all the time, and there's lots of passages here. Let me pick up uh, another couple to talk about Satan's side. In 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9, we read, Be alert. Be on watch. Be on the watch. Your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Be firm in your faith and resist him because you know that your fellow believers in all the world are going to the same kind of sufferings. So it means what? Should we expect any suffering? Well, pick a couple of other spots real quickly. Look at Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. What does God expect out of this controversy? In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us a secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together. Now that's not just here on this earth all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth with Christ as head. And if we jump over to chapter 3, the same verses 9 and 10, we notice these interesting comments. In order, uh, I'm sorry, I need to back up here to verse 9. And of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. Same secret plan. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all past ages. In order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. Who's supposed to be learning about God from the conflict here on this world? Angels in heaven. The entire onlooking universe. The entire onlooking universe. One more passage, Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of of God. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to Himself. God made peace through His Son's blood. That would be another, another term for, another code word for His sacrificial death on the cross. And so brought back to Himself all things, both on earth 
and in heaven. So it sounds to me like the controversy that began in heaven needs to be concluded not just on this earth, but where else? In heaven. God needs to clear his name in order to win the great controversy. It turns out that in the Old Testament, right in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 20, there's some very interesting verses that hint at this. Look at Ezekiel 20, starting with verse 8. But they defied me and refused to listen. Now this is talking about, God is talking about the history of the children of Israel from the time they left Egypt until they went into Babylonian captivity. And it says, they defied me and refused to listen. They did not throw away their disgusting idols and give up the Egyptian gods. I was ready to let them feel the full force of my anger and there in Egypt. But I did not since that would have brought dishonor to my name. For in the presence of the people among whom they were living, I had announced to Israel that I was going to lead them out of Egypt. So Paul, God has to act to do what? Protect his name. Protect. That, was, that was a prophecy? That was a prophecy. Well, it was. he's looking back at it now. Yeah, but it yeah. Was, at that time it yeah. was a prophecy. So Look at Ezekiel 20. Now drop down to verse, verse, uh, uh, verse 14. Well, even in the desert, he says in verse 13, he's leading them out through the desert. He says, I didn't let them die there in the desert be, since that would have brought dishonor to my name among the nations which had seen me lead Israel out of Egypt. Once again, different situation. God says, I had to take action because of what? My name. And what say, does that mean for my name? His name dishonor replies to his name. Yeah, it's not like reputation. He's trying to cover his, cover his reputation for things that are not working out like he thought they ought to be working out. And why weren't they working out? Well, Satan would say it's because uh, the way you design things doesn't work. Well, because the people were rebellious. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. And Satan would make those claims. Exactly, as Jay said. <laughs> and then if you go further down, he's talking about later generations who broke my law and profaned my Sabbath. Verse 22. But I didn't do that to them since that would have brought dishonor to my name among the nations which have seen me bring Israel out of Egypt. In other words, God says, I have to do things to honor my name, not just before the entire universe. I have to do things even to honor my name among the Egyptians and among the Canaanites, among the Philistines, among the other peoples in this earth. God's name is really important for some reason. But in those, in those cultures with so many gods, mm -hmm the God who was the most powerful was the God that you respected. And if he had taken his children out, crossed the Red Sea, and then left them out there in the desert, the people back in Egypt would have said, yeah, oh man, what a puny God they have. Well, and, and what if he had left them in Egypt? A God of a bunch of slaves? What, what, what good who, is he? Who needs that? Yeah. Then wave down in Babylonian captivity. You drop down to verses 43 and 44. Then you remember all the disgraceful things you did and how you defiled yourselves. You, were, you will be disgusted with yourselves because of all the evil things you did. When I act to protect my honor, you Israelites will know that I am the Lord because I do not deal with you as your wicked, evil actions deserve. The sovereign Lord has spoken. And isn't the second coming the same issue? Mm -hmm. Yes. Gary. <laughs> you made me lose. Oh, th there seems like there's a, something a little disturbing about this whole thing. What if there was no bad reason to go against his name? Would he have wiped them all out? What? What you if mean, there was no... If, what if nobody else cared? What if, what if he didn't care or there wasn't any reason to, to keep but, his name a certain way? Yeah. But that that's, would that's, he just wipe out everybody? That's the precise point here. God could have any time said, well, I'm just, it, the universe is just too much trouble. I'm going to wipe out either everybody in the entire universe so nobody will be left who remembers, or I'll just wipe out all their memories of evil. God could do that, but he doesn't. And the fact that he doesn't, what does that teach us about him? He has the power to do that. But he wouldn't exercise. But he will not to, ever he also exercise has a it that way. He has a conscience. Well, right throughout Israelite history, God has had to act 
not primarily for the salvation of his people, but for the honor of his own name. Now, virtually all Christians, they think, even if they know about the great controversy, the great controversy is about how God is going to save you and me, which smells a little bit like a selfish approach of Satan. Doesn't for his own name's sake sound a little selfish? Well, unless, unless we're talking about God. Because if he's running the whole universe and he does it on the basis of love, then what is he saying? If it's a law of human nature or the nature of, of intelligent creatures that they become like the person or thing that they worship or admire, the truth about him has to be demonstrated. Well, and if you want to bring a group of people back to live in that perfect environment, they have to be like you, if you're God. But your point is, I think he does benefit. There is a, uh, his universe is clean and happy, beating with one pulse of love. That's a tremendous thing that he has, do, that he has done for himself, well, and for us, but at, look at what costs to himself. It's the only way. It's the yeah. only way you can have a perfect, you can, right. you can live in a perfect environment. You think that Satan was worried about his name too? Well, no, well, yes and no, n but not really. All he cares about is getting as many people on his side as he, c as he can so they will die with him. Mm. And he knows that's what's going to happen to them. So you can't say, please join me, I'm so loving and kind, Please join me so you could die with me. No, but join me because I'm going to win the, I'm going to win the war. He thinks so. Yeah. That's well, insanity, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It is. We've seen an example of that with uh, uh, Heaven's Gates people yeah. and different little groups. Yeah. yeah. Well, the great controversy I'm suggesting is not so much about how God saves you and me. That's a side effect but about how God answers Satan's accusations against his character and government. When the great controversy is over, every person who is left living, and all those who have died, I might add, will have said, God, you did it right. There's nothing more you could have done, even the ones who die. Remember Philippians 2, uh, uh, verses 5 to 11, right there, every knee will bow and say, God, you are right. I have a comment here. It says, isn't the name exactly the same as the character? Yeah. Yeah, so. exactly. You know, you just, <clears throat> you had read um, Revelation 12, mm -hmm. you know, parts of it. That's a pretty small thing in the Bible. Um, it seems like the, the story is expanding way bigger than that little thing yeah. in the Bible. I mean, that little section in the Bible, Revelation 12. Uh, how does that happen? Well, and here, here would be my suggestion. We don't have nearly enough time to cover all the issues here. If you will look on our website, you've heard me mention it before, our website is www.theox.org. You will find available in two or three places under uh, extra materials there, you will find a handout entitled The Great Controversy in Scripture. And it will spell out I mean, what, three pages of quotations from Scripture that, that, that show you that this is what the issue is in Scripture. I, I'd like to comment on the, on the listeners then, mm -hmm. that the character and name are the same. So when God says, I'm defending my name, it's the equivalent of saying, I'm defending my character, I'm defending who I am. I'm responding to Satan's accusations against me. Right. It's, now, it's, it, it's not a bunch of rules and laws. No. It's a concept that God is love. Mm -hmm. And what God is doing is validating. And Satan has said love. basically, you will never get a bunch of those human beings to actually operate strictly on the basis of love. You can't do it. And God says, I will. Well, note especially that the purpose of the Sabbath is to remind us, this is now turning back to Ezekiel 20 and 36, the purpose of the Sabbath is to remind us of this particular very important truth. The Sabbath is to be a time when we get to know our God and are reminded of our relationship with Him. 
That's why we read Ezekiel 20, verses 12 and 20. We need to understand that his character and as much about him as possible, not just the right name by which to refer to him. If the Sabbath is not being used for this purpose, we are profaning it as far as God is concerned. And that's what it says there in verses 13 to 21. In Ezekiel 36, in case you think I'm just referring to one place, after all of Israel was in captivity, he explained further, wherever they went, this is Ezekiel 36, verses 20 to 22, wherever they went, talking about the Israelites, they brought disgrace on my holy name because people would say, these are the people of the Lord, but they had to leave his land. That made me concerned for my holy name since the Israelites brought disgrace on it everywhere they went. Now then, give the Israelites the message that I, the sovereign Lord, have for them. What I'm going to do is not for the sake of you Israelites, but the, for the sake of my holy name. Now, do you think God would ever have to say that in the 21st century? So here would, all this time I thought God was concerned about me. He's concerned about you, but he realizes that unless he solves this problem, if it turns out that we're not sure whether God is a tyrant, vengeful, exacting, unforgiving, severe, etc., how can God invite us to come and join him if we, if we think he's that kind of a person? You mean Jesus didn't come to die for me? He did, and, and he did by, by answering these questions, he died for you. Because these questions, if this question, if Jesus had failed in his efforts to, to clarify these issues, I think the whole universe would have fallen apart. He died so that we can learn the truth about him. Not well, even point. Isaiah realized how important this was. He stated God's reputation was the key in scripture. Isaiah 48, 11, what I do is done for my own sake. I will not let my name be dishonored or let anyone else share the glory that should be mine and mine alone. Daniel 9, 14 to 19. Daniel recognized that God must be doing something for his own reputation. I don't have time to read that right now. The glory of that is, though, is that as he takes care of his name, he gives us opportunity to be part of that process. Exactly, exactly. Now I'd like to turn to Ellen White, and she has some very plain and very startling words about all of this. And I'm now reading from the Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68, the bottom of the page, 69 at the top of the page. But the plan of redemption, now if I said to you, plan of redemption, what's the first thing that comes in your mind? Redeeming us. How God saves us, How right? God saves us. The plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. Does that, how many of us does that include? Ladies, do you think that includes you? Yes. yes. Absolutely. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded. That's part of the salvation. But it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. By the way, you will notice something very interesting if you look at, around in various reprints that we have done of this passage some of the volumes will, will have gone back in here, and you notice that Ellen White, when she says, will draw all unto me, if you look in your King James Version, the men following all is in italics. What does italics mean in the King James? It was added. It was not there in the original. It's been added by the translators. Ellen White says, I want you to know that the entire universe is involved, not just human beings, so she left the men out. We very carefully, when we reprint this, we often put the men back in because we think she misquoted. She did not misquote. She intentionally left that word men out. The act of Christ, by the way, I just last night was looking at a recent document where we put the men back in. Hmm. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, and that would be women too, but before all the universe, it would justify God and His Son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. 
It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and results of sin. As I mentioned, patriarchs and prophets, the bottom of 68, the top of 69. To the angels and the unfallen worlds, the cry, it is finished, had a deep significance. At that point in time, there wasn't a single human being that realized what in the world was going on there. All they, all they saw was a terrible disaster. The per, our friend that we loved, we loved to follow, we loved to listen to, is dead. But the angels, it was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. For them, did they need to be redeemed? What was God doing for the angels? Demonstrating. Teaching the truth about his character. Teaching the truth about his government. Answering Satan's questions and accusations. By All of that. demonstration. Yes. That needed to be done. Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. So by the sufferings and death of Christ, he did what? He revealed a great deal of truth about the character, not only of his father, but about who else? Satan. The arch apostate had so clothed himself with deception, I think we were talking about that a little earlier, weren't we? Right. That even holy beings, Jay, there's your angels in heaven. Even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. And that's straight out of that incredible chapter, It is Finished in Desire of Ages. So what do we conclude? The security of the universe was even more important to God than the salvation of man. And we, as sinful human beings, say, how could anybody be more important than us? Well, I have these words, and this is something you virtually will never hear. It comes from the Signs of the Times, July 12 of 1892, paragraph 2. It's Part of it's quoted in one place, lift him up, page 257. If you have the little disc of Ellen White's writings on in your computer, you can look it up there. It was in order that the heavenly universe might see the conditions of the covenant of redemption. Talking about redemption for who? Just human beings? He's talking about the whole universe, that Christ bore the penalty in behalf of the human race. The throne of justice, please notice this sentence, the throne of justice must be eternally and forever made secure, even though the race, now who's the race he's, he's, he's talking about? Earth. Human race. Human. The human race. Even though the race be wiped out and another creation populate the earth. God has to be proven true, even though every man is a liar. That sounds like something out of Paul, doesn't it? it does. Romans 3, verses 1 to 4, that's exactly what Paul said. By the sacrifice Christ was about to make, all doubts would be forever settled, and the human race would be saved, that's a secondary effect, if they would return to their allegiance. And why would we return to our allegiance? Because we can trust the one who is speaking to us. God can be trusted. So what was happening to the angels that they needed to be taken off that track? What was that track that they were on that, that Jesus saved them from? The fact that they still wondered about whether maybe Lucifer was right. A third of them were convinced, and two-thirds of them were so wavering. So all the questions were taken care of. Two-thirds of the angels that, heard the lies, but they really still needed more evidence to, to help solidify their thinking. Reading on, the cross of Calvary would be looked upon by the unfallen worlds. How many humans does that include? Have no, no human beings. Ah. We're talking about the rest of the universe. Um, by the heavenly universe, by satanic agencies, by the fallen race, and every mouth would be stopped. Why? because the answers, the truth about God has been clearly demonstrated. Who is able to describe the last scenes of Christ's life on earth? His trial in the judgment hall, his crucifixion, who witnessed these scenes? The heavenly universe, God the Father, Satan and his angels. We, could, we didn't know, we, the, the disciples ran away. They, they weren't there. Maybe John, maybe Peter for a little bit of it, but basically, 
who was there that really knew what was going on? Not a single human Nobody. being. Nobody. It's the onlooking universe who got the message. Uh, once again, that Signs of the Times, July 20, 1899, paragraph 2. So, did Christ really die for sinless angels too? Again, from Alan White, I'm now reading from the SDA Bible Commentary, December 30, 1889, paragraph 4. This is, this is uh, the portion where it's quoting from Ellen White. That which alone can effectually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. Not did, but will. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. The plan of salvation making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard. That means the records of the plan of salvation will be discussed and rediscussed and looked at, including all the sins, because that's part of the issue for the rest of eternity. It provides an eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And there's a number of references there if you get the handout. Why did the angels need the message of the cross? For centuries, God looked with patience and forbearance upon the cruel treatment given to his ambassadors, had his holy law prostrate, despised, trampled underfoot. He swept away the inhabitants of the Noachian world with a flood. But when the earth was again peopled, men drew away from God and renewed their hostility to him, manifesting bold defiance. Those whom God rescued from Egyptian bondage followed in the footsteps of those who preceded them. Cause was followed by effect. The earth was being corrupted. A crisis had arrived in the government of God. All heaven was prepared at the word of God to move to the help of his elect. One word from him and the bolts of heaven would have fallen upon the earth filling with fire and flame. What did the angels want to happen? Fire and flame. Yeah. They said, those bunch of sinners, God, you need to deal with them. God had but to speak, and there would have been thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes and destruction. The heavenly intelligences were prepared for a fearful manifestation of almighty power. Every move was watched with intense anxiety. The exercise of justice was expected. Expected by whom? The angels. The angels. The angels looked for God to punish the inhabitants of the earth. The heavenly universe was amazed at God's patience and love. To save fallen humanity, the Son of God took humanity upon Himself. Review and Herald, July 17, 1900, paragraph 4 to 7, and what, some other places. What do you think prepared the angels to think that way? The lies that they'd heard from the adversary. Maybe, maybe the, the war in heaven and, and, and Satan right. being cast out. They, That's why he had to wait to clear up until the cross. He had to show that he himself is involved in it. He couldn't have just let it happen to, to the human beings. He'd already done that with the flood, and that almost reinforced uh, Lucifer or Satan's lies. Right. You know, this whole subject here, this is, this is unique to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Absolutely. Right? You can go through everything, health message, Sabbath keeping, um, even second coming, and, but this is what's unique. No this other persuasion has this. This is, this is the unique part. It's, it's now, Mormons have something that's similar, but it doesn't go this direction very, at all. It's quite different. It's quite different, yeah. You yeah. know, it's almost it's, as if sin was required in order for everybody to learn. No, the, not required. Go ahead. Required. Finish, finish the sentence. In order for everybody to figure out what God was really like, and that's not a very good proposition to and propose. That's, and that's true. But did they need to go through that to be completely fulfilled and be happy to the extent that their cre creature was possible? And I think the answer to that is no. 
they were happy and fulfilled before the rebellion before started. Before the rebellion. They've never seen the, the length of, the, uh, of the limits of God's love, so yeah. to speak. And it's not the limit. It's still not the limit, but it, uh, but from our perspective. But no, they didn't need to No, they didn't need to. be totally happy. No. no. Yeah. But when it happened, God had a way to make lemonade out of lemons. Yeah. From the beginning, it has been Satan's. And here's, here's Mike give you some clue about how all this kind of nonsense apparently started in heaven. From the beginning, it has been Satan's studied plan to cause men to forget God, that he might secure them to himself. In other words, Satan recognizes if you know God and you know the truth about God, you're never going to believe him. So he has to sort of try to get people to set God aside mm -hmm. so they'll accept him. Keep him lulled and lazy. Mm -hmm. Hence he has sought to misrepresent the character of God, to lead men to cherish a false conception of him. The Creator has been presented to their minds as clothed with the attributes of the Prince of Evil himself, as arbitrary, severe, and unforgiving. Who is it that's really arbitrary, severe, and unforgiving? Satan. Satan. Who does he want us to think is, is, is arbitrary, severe, and unforgiving? God. God. That he might be feared, shunned, and even hated by men. Satan hoped to, do, to so confuse the minds of those whom he had deceived that they would put God out of their knowledge. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5. So the great controversy will not be over until we recognize that the primary issue is not about us. The truth is, we are all a bunch of sinners. Finished. I don't need to say anything more. Okay? The truth is, God's character needs to be shown very clear, and we need to recognize this. And we need to realize that to be saved, we need to honor and represent and respect and, 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 and worship that kind of character. So it's all about God's reputation. And then some very scary words. We're just about finished. Multitudes. This is Prophets and Kings, page 177. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God. And that's what we've been talking about the last hour. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and His attributes and are as truly serving a false god as were the worshipers of Baal. What Would am I supposed anyone to living in the 21st century be worshiping Baal? And what am I supposed to do about that? You better find out what's the truth about God. That's what it's all about. So what about us? Do we have a correct picture of God and His character? A correct understanding of the great controversy is the distinctive doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you want to be one of those, you better understand what the great controversy is all about. Spelled out by Ellen White in the Bible and study the character of God until you know it so well that not even the devil himself can deceive you. Then you're a Seventh-day Adventist. See you next week.